Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Quirky Inspirations. I have the absolute joy and pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Kate Lund, who is a clinical psychologist, speaker, author, executive coach, and a number of other things. But that's what's in her official bio. Let's find out from Kate. Kate, tell us about you. Got it. Well, absolutely. So you covered the professional side. I love it. And I think beyond that, I am a mom of 15 year old twin boys. Um, I've been married for 25 years. I, um, I know that's a very long time, right? Congratulations. Yep. 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 And um, let's see, I'm a dog lover. Mm -hmm. I have two dogs, a Westie and a Brittany doodle, both of whom what? Brittany doodle. Brittany Doodle is a mix of 50% Brittany Spaniel and 50% Poodle, standard Poodle. So right. he's a big boy, he's a big boy, big active boy. He's actually just been certified. We did the training. He's a, a certified therapy dog. Oh, lovely. And we go out in the world and we visit uh, residents in assisted living facilities. And mm -hmm. once he turns two, we'll be visiting uh, kids in children's hospitals. And oh. we're really excited about that. Lovely, lovely. Because I know you had a, there's a picture on your, your Facebook page of an Airedale. Yes, my Airedale putter. Yes, we mm. had putter for 13 years. Um, she was an absolutely stellar dog. And mm. I grew up with Airedales. So that's why oh, Ted right. and I got her as our very first dog. And just an amazing dog. I mean, you should have seen how she bonded with the boys when they were born. Oh, um, just, just magnificent. And yes, that was very, very sad. She has her own book called Putter in the I Red Car. That. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, it was super cool, fun project. We, um, I wrote the book after we had moved from Boston to Seattle as a family. Mm -hmm. And Putter was with us on that road trip. And it was super cool, super fun. She stayed in the hotels with us each night. There were certain places where she could actually come to dinner and sit under the table. It was so fun. And uh, yeah, so Putter in the Red Car is out there. Fantastic book and, and just a super fun project. Oh, lovely, lovely. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting my eyes on that one as well. So yeah. the, that, I'm, I'm getting the sense then that whilst you have an overarching job, brief, if you will, <laughs> your heart lies with children. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. And, you know, a lot of my actual professional work has been with children and mm -hmm. families, uh, working with them on building resilience, working through challenge, particularly particularly related to medical challenges or physical disabilities. And mm -hmm. a lot of my work these days relates to that very thing with parents, more specifically right. than with kids, because I'm working primarily virtually right now. Okay. Um, but yeah. Is that, is that as a result of COVID or was that happening generally anyway? It was actually happening a bit before COVID so that mm -hmm. I could be more available for my own kids. Mm -hmm. I found that going to the office sort of after school hours when I wanted mm -hmm. to be available for my own kids was getting really taxing. Yeah. So I kind of shifted gears a little bit. And that's the nice thing about being a psychologist. You can sort of be eclectic in your approach. You know, you mm -hmm. can work with many different populations and that has really worked out well for me. So much of my work is focused with adults these days, both in coaching and in, you know, parenting and, you know, mm -hmm. also working clinically with folks who have anxiety, depression, PTSD, that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Okay. Because um, g going back to the, the children thing and the, the parenting, um, tell us more about why that's so important to you. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the reason that's so important to me, it really goes back to my own childhood when I was growing up with a serious medical condition called hydrocephalus, which is essentially when the cerebral spinal fluid isn't circulating as it should and causes pressure to build up on the brain. Mm -hmm. So it meant a lot of time in and out of the hospital, a lot of time coming back to school, looking different, really strange haircuts, couldn't do a lot of the things my friends could do. And yeah. so it was, it was a really difficult thing and really got me in touch with understanding 
my own unique context. And my parents were really, really instrumental in helping me focus on the things I could do as opposed to the things I couldn't do and defining me by the condition I happen to have. So that really was a key for me, a catalyst in, you know, moving forward and doing the things I've done. And, but definitely my interest in resilience, my interest in helping parents navigate these kinds of challenges today goes back to that time. Right, right. Because the unique context now that that's obviously psych speak for for those right. who are not who are not in in the, the psychology world can you unpack what that means in layman's terms please yeah sure so our own unique context it's really kind of you know what makes us who we are where do our strengths lie mm-hmm. how can we use our strengths to you know, move through and beyond the challenges that are inevitably going to come up in our lives. And really this idea sort of beyond that of helping our kids, helping ourselves to understand that context, to understand who we are from the inside out, sort of a, uh, an awareness, if you will. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're right. I mean, we, we've, we've all got our own little quirky um, ways of doing things and being aware of where our strengths are and working to them i mean i'm, I'm mindful of my, my background is in speech pathology and i've worked mm-hmm. with adults with autism for many years mm-hmm. and the things that the the high functioning guys were telling me was i'm broken mm-hmm. and you go um where'd you get that idea mm-hmm. all through school they had mm-hmm. had underlined what they couldn't do Right. And I mean, it's very clear with, with the, the autistic folk, the people on the autism spectrum, but it's the same for everyone going through school, isn't it? Yes. We, we have told, we're told all the time what we can't do. Right, right. And we really want to flip that paradigm mm. and focus more on what we can do and mm. how we can build on what we can do to really help us move forward towards our potential. And okay. that's what I help parents sort of build into their lives with their children these days. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was so fortunate to have happen in my own life early on with my parents, as well as my teachers, parents of friends, that sort of thing. And another Mm -hmm. really important piece for me was that, you know, there was a lot, there were a lot of physical things I couldn't do. Like I couldn't, you know, do gymnastics with my friends. I couldn't bounce on trampolines at, at parties. Mm-hmm. I couldn't, you know, do things like that. I had to wear this huge hockey helmet on my head when I skated with my class at, at, at gym or recess and, and kids laughed. I mean, nobody wore helmets back in the day, right? I'm very mm-hmm. old, Wendy. So I, it was a long time ago. And so, you know, that, that stuff was hard, but what, what we discovered or what, I don't know how it happened, but I really loved to play tennis and that was a safe sport for me. And so a lot of emphasis was put on that both by myself and I was encouraged by my family and, you know, they gave me the opportunities to build that skill. And that really became a central piece of my identity and really helped me to flourish in many ways and believe in myself in many ways. And Important thing to mention, though, along with this, is I was never the best. I just loved to play. I wasn't bad. I was pretty good. I have a lot Mm -hmm. of second place trophies, but never really the first place trophies. Mm -hmm. And so that also was a really good life lesson. You know, you don't have to win. You don't have to be the best. I know there's a culture of winning out there. And of course, we want to be the best that we can possibly be. And I believe that I was, but that's, all that matters if if you're not getting the first place trophy that's okay right you're just as long as you're giving it your best i mean if i was out there tanking on purpose or you know wasn't having fun or you know that would be a, a different problem you don't want kids to do that you want them to really be giving their all in terms of what they're capable of yeah. and that that's sort of an example of of what happened with me there Cool. But lifelong the, the, friendships. Lifelong friendships. From oh, that. lovely. Because I, I did notice the varsity tennis was in your on your LinkedIn profile. I've been snoopy. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Okay. Yeah, I did. I, I was able to. Yeah, I played tennis in college, which was super fun. I my hat hat goes off to you because anything with eye hand coordination, and I find <laughs> that a distinct challenge. But it's yeah, <laughs> my own challenge. 
So the 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 concept of of being content with number two, if that's as far as you can you can go compared to other people, I love to to, to pick up on that because one of the things that we're encouraged to do in society is compare ourselves, isn't it? Mm-hmm. with everybody yes. around and I think that's something that young folk today are more are more aware of because of the likes of Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and all this jazz that that with the best will in the world uh, neither of us were blessed with <clears throat> uh, growing <laughs> up I mean we, we we had our peers but we didn't have the whole world to compare ourselves with did we Right, precisely. That's that's a very, very good point. And it's hard, you know, what kids are contending with these days in that mm. in that realm. I mean, because the, the comparison is that everything is like right there in their face, you know, and particularly for girls who are comparing themselves in terms of looks and mm-hmm. beauty and popularity and all these things. But there are plenty of things for boys to be comparing themselves with as well. Yes. I mean, I have to 15 year old boys and they, you know, are certainly looking at their rowers and, you know, looking at the rowing times out there and what do we mm-hmm. need to, you know, get into the best colleges and how does that going to, how's that going to look? And you really can't know now. Right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's hard. And so I'm always, you know, talking with folks about this idea of how can we encourage our kids, help our kids to not compare themselves to others and these images that they're seeing because the thing is with these um social media images a lot of it isn't real right a lot of it is just you're seeing that snapshot in time of Mm -hmm. the perfect moments and as we both know all moments are not perfect and 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 what we also know the, the young folk don't necessarily know is the one that gets posted it's probably the 30th one that they've looked at first before they decide, oh, that's the best one. Ping, mm-hmm. up that goes. Right, right, yeah. exactly. So really important to help our kids to not compare themselves and really easier said than done. But we have a microcosm of that here at the house because as we were talking about earlier, our twins, they're very different in a lot of ways. You know, we're fortunate and they're very good friends. They really are. And they're able to, I think, accept each other's differences, Mm -hmm. you know, for for what they are. But one of them has a much easier time academically, for example. And the other one has really struggled over time and has taken a longer um, time to sort of come into his own in that way. But, you know, he's making so much progress now, freshman year in high school. So amazing to see. But, you know, I'm sure... I mean, actually, I know there've been hard moments along the way, but we've really worked hard to help him see what are the things that he's good at and how can he use those to help him in the areas where it's more of a struggle? And then how can we help him develop those softer skills, self-advocacy skills, skills of self-awareness, all of the things in our social-emotional uh bucket that we really want to be instilling in our kids as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so, so important to build that ability in our kids to understand individual difference, to appreciate that, to know that we're not all the same. And that I think will really help them on this comparison front. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was talking to a lady who is um, an artist as, as in she's a singer Mm. and she that 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 is a cutthroat business being being a professional singer how do you you rise to the top oh yeah and I was pointing out to her that the only comparison that you can comfortably do comfortably that is most sensible for you is to compare yourself with yourself yes going yes on, with yourself yeah. a few uh, a, a year two years five years down the line previously yes and acknowledging the progress that you personally have made, as you were saying yes. about being content to be number two in the in the, the tennis, how far did you come from to get where you are? Yeah, that, exactly. that's something that certainly in, in coaching business, the coaching side of things, from, from my perspective, is a really important thing to instill in people. This is not comparing yourself to other people, right. because very often... We are comparing our third step along the way mm-hmm. with their third or fourth year along the way. Right, right. 
Yeah. And just being content with your fundamental aptitudes and abilities, right? Mm. And for me, those looked a little bit different, particularly early on than for my peers, particularly those who are, you know, on the top of the tennis ladder, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe they could just naturally run faster or farther, you know, some things that, you know, were a bit more challenging for me, particularly when I was recovering from a surgery or I was coming back from the hospital or whatever, that was okay. And so what happened for me, and I think this is a really important thing to try to instill in our kids in general as well, challenge or not, is that I learned to really work hard, harder than perhaps, you know, I would have otherwise, but that was a really great life lesson because it became my baseline over Mm -hmm. time, Mm -hmm. you know, and when some of my peers hit, you know, a roadblock, you know, late in high school or on their way to college and, you know, things had always come really, really easily to them. They didn't know what to do. And the sort of accolades were coming from the outside in. Then all of a sudden they had to rely on themselves. They didn't know what to do. Mm. And so I'm not saying that's a universal experience, but it's something that I sort of observed. And I'm not saying I had it all down either, but I did have this sort of foundational work ethic that was kind of dialed in. And that really helped me excel in college and find some opportunities that I probably wouldn't have other, otherwise found. Great. Yeah. Um, I remember when when I, I, I failed my second year high school maths exam. Oh. First time I'd ever failed anything. Right. I, I was distraught. Mm-hmm. And mum said to me, I'm actually glad this has happened. Yeah. Said, she said, you've now got the opportunity to see that you can come back from this. Yes. I love that, that she was spot on because that is the lesson, right? And if things mm-hmm. are coming too easily, it's, it's not, it's going to be a rude awakening when there is a moment of failure or not succeeding the first time out of the gate and having never yeah. experienced that. And it's, it's a big deal, you know, and it happens. And so I think one thing that's really important for us as parents to do is to share those experiences that we've had in our own lives where we haven't succeeded with our kids. And I've been very transparent with my boys. And I think it's, I think it's been helpful in certain ways, you know, to Mm -hmm. help them understand, particularly the one who has struggled a bit more Mm -hmm. because there've been moments where he has not passed a test or he has not, you know, succeeded in something that he's wanted to the first time out of the gate. And I think he, he knows that he can talk to me about it and, you know, we can have a discussion, a dialogue, and it's going to be okay. It might not feel good, but at least we're able to talk about it. Whereas if our kids see us as these infallible, always succeeding creatures or people, mm-hmm. um, then they're going to probably shut down yeah. when a failure happens or when they don't feel good about something or they haven't done as well as they can or what have you. And so I think it's really important for us to have authentic transparent relationships with our with our kids as best we can. I mean, you know, yeah. none of this is easy. It's all easier said than done, but you know, I think it's it's an important concept to think about. Yeah. And picking up on that point, the the fact that different children require different parenting styles. Yes. Absolutely. To to bring out the best in each of them. Mm-hmm. And then when yes. they're younger, that's not fair he gets away with this and you don't let me get away with and and being able to navigate that with them yes yeah it's a a fun one isn't it says she who's never been a parent (laughs) well it's it's yeah that that can be very difficult for sure Mm -hmm. we we've been lucky in that we haven't had a lot of that because um you know uh our boys are in different schools And so they've been able to sort of carve out their own context or their Mm. own kind of way of being in, in those moments. But earlier on, it is true. They were in the same school Mm -hmm. and the one who struggled with academics, is very, very social. It was a small school. So there weren't that many boys sort of to Mm -hmm. form friendships with other ones, very, very academic, a little bit of a harder time in the social domain there because he was, is very socially, emotionally evolved. And that wasn't typical for your eight-year-old boy at that time. Mm -hmm. 
And so we knew at that point that we really had to find a different school for the one who was academically sort of gifted mm -hmm. and made, has made all the difference in the world. You know, he's come into his own socially, he's killing it academically, you know, it's just really good. Mm -hmm. and the other one, you know, maintained his friendships at that other school through eighth grade and has now moved on to, to a different high school and, you know, is also coming into his own. So mm -hmm we were kind of lucky. We didn't have a lot of that's not fair. He doesn't have this. I have mm -hmm. this, you know, type of stuff, but you know, we, we were, we were fortunate. I think they had their own context to sort of develop within. Yeah. That's great. That's great. We could talk all day. We could talk all day. The, the thing about, I mean, you, you, you've got two books out. You've got Putter and the, the, the red train, red car. Car. sorry. Car. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us about the other one. Sure. So bounce, help your child build resilience and thrive in school sports and life is, is sort of a model of how we can help our children to be as resilient as they can possibly be within their own context or way of living or what have you. And we outline seven pillars of the resilient child. And those came from sort of my own experiences growing up, what I've observed in my kids as well as my clinical work over the course mm -hmm. of 20 years. Uh, so it's sort of a culmination of all those things. And so the mm -hmm. pillars are how to help our kids tolerate frustration and manage emotions, how to help them navigate friendships and social pressures, uh, how to sustain focus and attention, how to develop courage, build motivation, how to be optimistic and how to find confidence within the construct or their way of living. And so those are the seven pillars. And we kind of dive into each of those from a developmental perspective, but also mm -hmm. more importantly, from a story perspective. And I share composite stories that illustrate the main points. And then we have practical strategies that parents and teachers can use to help instill these these um these pillars in their own children or help them develop over time but the really important piece to note here is that <clears throat> all of what we talk about in the book applies to all of us across the lifespan mm. it just so happens that this is a child-centric book because all of my composite stories are kid focused should sure. come from you know the kid domain based on my many, many years of clinical work in that realm, my own kids being young at that point, and my own experiences as a kid. But the pillars that I that I outlined here really apply to all of us across the lifespan because we all mm. need confidence. We all need optimism. We all need to be able to manage our emotions, tolerate frustrations. You know, we all need to be doing all of these things. So Absolutely. that's an important thing to note about the book. Thank you very much. Because the the, the the um the primary target audience for this book is what parents of you said elementary school children yes yes so exactly for, for those of us not in the US what what are the age span there uh so the book really is looking at uh parents of kids from six to say 11 okay right yeah thank you or maybe 12 you know that kind of thing uh yeah. you know and if 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 parents want to look at it from the perspective of their teenager, that would work too. But mm -hmm. again, the stories are going to be more relatable to the parents of younger kids. The thing though, we, when you've got a good story, you draw people in and they then go, okay, I'm putting myself in that story. Mm -hmm. And I can right. relate to this from my perspective. So there will be parents who are reading that and going, I remember when they were such and such age. Yeah. Now, how can I? Oh, yeah. That can now relate to what they're doing now. And you can bring people in. So whilst the, the stories may, the context of those stories may be at a, uh, an eight-year-old. Sure. 16-year-old. Okay. We've got a bit more hair and a bit more hormones. Um, <laughs> but the same thing is, yeah, the, the similar situations, slightly different different clothing if you will yes precisely um, yeah precisely yeah and we've got a um a companion course to the book mm -hmm. um also called bounce 
and basically goes through the principles outlined in the book in video format with a companion workbook that has different exercises in it than the book does. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. And that's an online self-paced course? Yes, it's an online self-paced course. Yes, that can be accessed through my website. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes. Oh, two books, online course. What we haven't mentioned so far is she's a TEDx speaker. Oh, so yeah, super all fun. sorts of wonderful things our dear darling Dr. Kate Lund has gone up to. And she's a prolific podcaster has a wonderful podcast that interviews some amazing people around the subject of resilience and lots of wonderful things like that. Oh, I've been a member, I've been a, a guest as well. So I'm very grateful for that. So loved Kate, that conversation, loved it. It was great. We, we, we had so much fun with words, didn't we? <laughs> yes, we did. So the thing with, with Kate is she is such a wonderfully all round human being that has got her finger on the pulse of resilience so I'm curious Kate there will be some internal scripts that you're running some things that you tell yourself that are really empowering when you hit those challenges when you hit those roadblocks or detours or plot twists if you will if we're taking on the the literary theme what do you tell yourself? What are those things that you can live by? Yeah, that's such a great question. and such an important question, right? And so what I always tell myself and what I try to help others to see, those that I'm working with, is this idea of believing in possibility, particularly the possibility on the other side of challenge and helping our kids to do the same. Mm. So you come from that situation, I mean, way back when, when you had the hydrocephalus and not being able to do so many different things and your parents instilled in you that thought that, okay, this is a challenging situation. What could be on the other side? Mm -hmm. And that, yes. that sense of wonder and possibility. Yes. Because one of the things that I find pulling on from, from this, this wonderful script that you're running is that very often, I, in particular, am so stuck in what I can see in front of me, mm, forgetting yes. that the, the little flashlight torch that I have in hand in front of me will only reveal the three feet, one meter in front. Mm -hmm. It can't yes. go any further. And so it's up to me to think what could happen. What are the mm -hmm. possibilities? What is out there if I take that next step? Because as I take that next step, the light shines a bit further forward. Right. Yes, precisely. Possibility. Hmm? So possibility thinking rather than that. I've got the three. I mean, going back to the, the, the TEDx thing, the, the, the team that I work with, they are insistent that the speakers stay within the the three meter diameter yeah. red circle yes and that's the, the metaphor I'm thinking of at this point because when I'm in that red circle I am not allowed to step out of it I'm not allowed to see the possibilities beyond now my extrapolation from what you're saying is I don't know what's beyond let's think what could it be and get excited about that Yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love the way that you're, you're framing that, you know, easier said than done, but oh, it is. really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. What's on the other side of our challenge? Ooh. Yes. Could be there. It may not be, but what could be and get excited mm -hmm. about that it leads yes. us on through those challenges. Lovely. Lovely. Kate, we've talked about lots of different things. The title of this podcast is Quirky Inspirations. You've given us some beautiful inspiration to finish with. We've explored a bit of your quirkiness, the fact that you have so many skills devised and, and developed over the, the years of your learned experience. I've worked with clinical psychs 
most of well, all of my um, clinical experiences, uh, clinical practice as a speech pathologist, none of them had got that level of learned ex lived experience. Mm. There were things that had happened that got them inspired in that direction. However, it's the lived experience that's, that is the standout thing for me. Yes. And I honor your experience and for you living your talk. You have been there. You know what it's like to have some pretty major stuff in your way. And you've worked through it. Thank you for sharing your quirky inspirations with us. Well, thank you for having me, Wendy. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Great. Bye bye for now.